Welcome everyone. Welcome to Charcha 2020. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Lakshmi and I will be your host for the plenary tracks of this conference. We are very happy to host all of you in this virtual conference, as well as the many others that are joining us through the multiple live streaming platforms. Over the next three days, we and our co-hosts are very excited to bring to you conversations on a wide range of development issues with over 400 speakers from across the development ecosystem. COVID warriors, Nobel laureates, economists, government officials, nonprofit leaders, philanthropists, and many more. We have a fairly packed schedule ahead of us, so I would like to quickly share some logistics details. My colleagues Isha and Tanvi will be supporting the plenary session. They will share some important instructions for Q&A as well as other updates on the chat window. So please do look out for it. Feel free to reach out to them for support during the sessions as well. With that out of the way, it's my pleasure to introduce our very first speaker of the conference, Mr. Muthuraman, ex-Vice Chairman of Tata Steel. Mr. Muthuraman has served on the boards of several leading corporates and academic institutions in India. He was conferred with the Padma Bhushan in 2020. We're also very privileged that he's among the early supporters of the Nudge Foundation. Welcome, sir. I invite you to open Charcha 2020. Thank you, Lakshmi. And uh, good afternoon to all of you, delegates, speakers, and the panelists. As we all know, COVID-19 is really threatening to push back some 200 million people or more in India, much deeper into poverty. If this were to happen, this will undo the work all of us have done over several years to lift millions of people out of the poverty line. This is indeed a very serious issue and needs to be addressed immediately. Conversation on this subject needs to begin now so that we are not too late to take action. This is precisely the reason for Charcha 2020. Conceived barely two weeks ago by the NEDS Foundation, today we launched the coming together of 16 host patrons, 100 plus development organizations, delivering 150 or more hours of content and learning, reaching over 10,000 participants over the webinar, and lacks more through the live channels across the Quint and other media houses. But this is just the beginning of a series of actions all of us can and must take to put India back on its developmental journey towards economic prosperity and social well-being. I wish this conference all success. It's once again a pleasure for me to welcome all of you. Over to Lakshmi. Thank you, sir. Thank you. With those words setting the tone for Charcha 2020, I would like to move on to our first plenary session, Convergent India to a Better Post-COVID World. Our speakers for the session are Dr. Rajiv Kumar and Amit Chandra. Dr. Rajiv took over as the Vice Chairman of Niti Aayog in the rank and status of cabinet minister on 1st September 2017. He also serves as the chancellor of Gokhale Institute of Politics and Economics in Pune. He has wide experience of having worked in government, academia, industry, as well as in multilateral institutions. He was a professor at IIFT Delhi and was with the ADB in Manila for over 10 years. His earlier stints with the government of India was with the in Ministry of Industry and subsequently as economic advisor with the Department of Economic Affairs Finance Ministry. He's also served as the independent director on the Central Board of RBI and State Bank of India. Dr. Rajiv has doctoral degrees in economics from Lucknow University and Oxford University. Welcome to the conference, sir. Thank you. Amit Chandra is the founder and chairman of the India Office of Bain Capital Private Equity and is a renowned philanthropist. Over the years, 
Amit has served on the boards of many leading corporates and nonprofits, including Tata Sons, Genpak, Piramal Enterprises, Ashoka University, Akansha Foundation, and Give India. He and his wife, Archana, were awarded the Asia Heroes of Philanthropy Award in 2016. Welcome, Amit, and over to you for this session. Thank you, Lakshmi. Um, my compliments to the team at Nudge for organizing Charcha 2020, a dialogue which is very much uh, needed at this point of time. Um, and uh, thank you so much, uh, Raji, for uh, being a part of this plenary session. I don't think we could have had uh, any better speaker than you uh, for this session. Uh, thank you, Muthu, for uh, your opening remarks and setting the tone for this uh, discussion. Um, you know, I'd like to build upon what uh, Muthu said uh, and open up with uh, a few thoughts on why we must converge before I hand over to Raji for his uh, opening remarks. You know, the crisis has been a very humbling experience for me. It's made me really realize how small I am and indeed how small I think many of us are, uh, we have truly an outstanding set of speakers uh, in this uh, conference, but I think COVID has uh, made us really realize um, how small countries are and how small all of us are as individuals relative to this huge problem that we face. At the same time, I think it has made us appreciate that if we truly plan ahead and if we collaborate, that we can achieve a lot uh, in fighting big problems. But as uh, uh, Muthu pointed out, uh, it's important to put the problem ahead in perspective. Uh, you know, we've made a lot of progress over the uh, many years uh, and accelerated uh, in the past uh, five, seven years, um, but we were still a work in progress economy. Uh, one fifth of our citizens were uh, below the poverty line just be uh, before COVID struck us. And as recent surveys point out, uh, two thirds of households are now uh, reasonably stressed uh, on account of what's happened uh, with COVID. And I think till a vaccine really emerges, we're gonna face some sort of challenges uh, which are gonna continue um, stressing us out. A hundred million jobs have been lost as per some surveys. Hopefully many of these will be temporary and they'll come back. But you know, all of these are statistics and what haunts me and keeps me up many nights are actually the images. Um, the hungry faces I see when I step out uh, occasionally for a walk, uh, or especially those of people who are reduced to beg, uh, who really don't want to beg. Many of them are begging for the first time. The images that uh, journalists have been posting of migrants uh, walking thousands of kilometers home. The posts on Facebook of youngsters who, um, whose dreams are shattered because they don't know whether they'll get jobs in the next few years. Uh, the phone calls I often get of people begging for a hospital bed uh, for a relative uh, you know, who they know will die if they don't get a hospital bed on time. I mean, these are images and voices that uh, really haunt me and make me wonder as to what we're really going to do uh, to rebuild uh, India in the, in, in the, in the decades, uh, in the years ahead. You know, it's for all these people and for all these statistics that we must converge and ensure that India is not set back by decades but at best we have a temporary setback and we start this job of rebuilding with some degree of urgency. I know that the government is gonna do a lot and I know the government is gonna have its hands more than full. The good news about this crisis is that civil society and NGOs have proven that it is capable of galvanizing and doing a lot. If it wasn't for civil society and NGOs, millions of people would have actually faced extreme hunger, um, maybe thousands would have died. Many migrants would have erupted in, hung in anger and we would have actually had a law and order problem uh, which the administration would have faced if it wasn't for what civil society would have done. And I think civil, uh, the government I know in many places is deeply appreciative of the role that civil society has played. I think the next phase, uh, civil society and NGOs need to actually uh, work hand in hand with the government in figuring out how it can actually rebuild India by uh, starting to focus on livelihoods as the next set of issues. So we need to now think about what we can do to look at things more strategically and collaboratively. Civil society and NGOs are facing their own set of challenges at this point of time. 
with what has happened to companies, CSR funding is beginning to dry up rapidly. And that pose, poses its own set of problems for NGOs. Working uh, in a manner in which uh, is not fragmented as uh, NGOs have worked in the past is going to be critical. Many NGOs are going to face the issue of viability and will have, they'll have to find ways to reinvent themselves. Long neglected problems will actually rise to the top and so no, new priorities will emerge. New ways of working will need to be found from a delivery perspective. But I think what's most important in all of this is that NGOs and civil society have proven that a sense of purpose and dedication is what makes this sector special. And that's what will stand uh, it in good stead in the years and decades ahead as a beacon of hope uh, to the rest of humanity. And I think uh, I'd like to end at least my opening remarks with that uh, beacon of hope uh, as we look at, uh, you know, the way to rebuild, help rebuilding India. Um, you know, with that, I'd like to actually uh, hand over to Rajiv and get him to uh, deliver his opening remarks and then we can uh, engage in, I wouldn't call it a fireside chat, uh, the fire is burning outside. Um, we'd uh, like to have more of a conversation uh, and then open it up to a Q&A session. But Rajiv, uh, over to you. Uh, I know the audience is eagerly waiting for your opening remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Amit. Uh, and uh, hi, and, and, and uh, my compliments, uh, adding my compliments to what Amit said about uh, Nudge India organizing, this, I think, an important dialogue, important conference. So Atul and Isha, uh, congratulations. Well done. Look forward to interacting with you even further. Apologies to uh, Mr. Muthuraman, because I was a little late. I thought we started. Nothing started at least two minutes past the hour, but you started two minutes ahead of the hour. Uh, but so I missed your opening remarks. So uh, sorry, sorry about that. Um, uh, friends, I think um, <clears throat> um, this, is a, this is a topic that um, is very close to my heart. And therefore, if I do uh, kind of uh, get overboard, as it were, in my remarks and if you feel that I've kind of crossed some uh, lines then you uh, then 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 uh, apologies in advance because I, I will not uh, like to mince words I like to say whatever I can I want to and let me start off by saying that uh, COVID-19 uh, has become like a, a proverbial low tide and when the low tide comes you know all of us are caught with our you know with all the warts with all the frailties and weaknesses that we have and COVID-19 has done that for our society, which is that it really has, uh, you know, projected in, a, in many ways uh, what were, what have been the weaknesses, the, you know, the, the you know, the sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, I mean, the extreme, uh, you know, inequality, if you like, the misery of vast numbers of people and so on. And I think this is therefore, in some sense, I serve like a very, very important wake up call for all of us, not for just us, for the whole world, as it were, in some sense. And, uh, and I think to that extent, we must follow the Prime Minister's call for converting this into an opportunity. And uh, I, I, I do want to say that I think that post-COVID, I mean, there will be, in, uh, from what I've seen, people will talk about a pre-COVID and a post-COVID BC and AC uh, sort of world that we have got because many things in this world order will change. I hope for the better, but I'm not so sure that all of them would be uh, for the better, but we should be prepared uh, for that. And I think uh, uh, these will, there are at the moment, a uh, huge number of unknowns and huge number of unknown unknowns that will unfold before us, uh, before this pandemic is out. And, uh, you know, geopolitics, geostrategy, geoeconomics, uh, all of that uh, could change. And I think for that, for us to be prepared to face that, we need to have the agility we need to have the flexibility. We need to have also the convergence amongst our all stakeholders to be able to face that new world and make the best of it and make the best of it. And I'm being in some sense parochial, uh, of course, to the world, but I'll make the best of it as far as we, the th you know, 130 billion people, Indians are concerned, how to use, how to 
engage with that world so that you know we are we are able to uh, make the best of it sometimes of not very good uh, situation that may arise in the coming years so we need for that uh, and it's a, it's, i'm not using it as a cliche um, but we do need a new india at this point of time we need to think differently we need to behave differently and nudge i think is the best uh, sort of you know you know in, in some sense uh, icon for it because we need to nudge ourselves and nudge everybody else for this behavioral change that must come about if we want to uh, take india forward in a, in a changing in a you know rapidly changing world where the where several turbulences have combined today i mean there is a there is a political geopolitical turbulence that we can see there is a massive technology turbulence you know that has never been seen before uh, people who have led kai fo cleese uh, ai superpowers would, would would know that we might we are getting into a situation where technology will replace all sorts of jobs without the possibility of it creating new new industries being able to create enough jobs you know for that you know for for those who are lost uh, you know you've got uh, uh, you've got uh, social uh, turbulence of all all varieties uh, you know so uh, and and you've got the environmental turbulence because i mean everywhere if you see uh, you know it seems almost as if uh, you know a crisis is imminent and and it is there is a call there for you know for from from nature from you know from global community from the technology world for us uh, to step up to the plate because if we don't and if we go on with the business as usual then i'm sure we will fail we'll fail ourselves we'll fail the we we'll fail uh, humanity and you know and and i i don't know the consequences of that so i think uh, my my really the first point that i want to do on emphasize is that we must jettison any ideas of business as usual uh, let alone not jettison any complacency uh, that we might have which we are very used to by the way all of us uh, especially uh, us you know we tend to get uh, complacent very quickly because a nice dose of fatalism and a nice dose of uh, and an uh, in, inurement in uh, us being inured to our surroundings and you know and so on i mean so we need to think differently and that's the that that can be in some sense uh, you know the theme of my song is it were going to forward and the rest are examples in some sense uh, one part of it of thinking differently is that we must make note of how dualistic a society we have become how dualistic an economy we have become i mean it is us and them all the time everywhere and there are so many examples so many statistics that i can cite you on this but if you look at any area whether it's education whether it's health whether it's you know recreation entertainment it's us and them and this dualism is so marked that yesterday for example i was taking a meeting here of uh, education technology now there are at the top end of this educational technology pyramid the best courses the best things available for a very high price and at the same time when i thought as to how we should extend it i was told that 64% of our schools in this country don't have electricity and th- only 35% of schools have internet connections and the bandwidth there is incredible you can imagine what there is now how do we talk about education technology how we talk about clicks plus bricks which we keep talking about it you know at all the time in our own conversations until we until we rectify you know what's happening to those 64% of the schools that we've got no electricity you know and and and, and have we have we have we put enough attention on that i'm not you see, i'm not a bleeding heart i'm not a socialist i was one at one point time i was a, i was a, i was a rank communist you know a sort of blazing communist uh, you know when i left college uh, you know and 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 ran away uh, but these are realities that you can see today health i mean 200 children die every day in this country from diarrhea and pneumonia every day that's like a that's like a airbus t20 crashing every day but i mean does it make does it make news in this country 38% of our children are undernourished you know within between before the age of 3 you know and that means that their brain development is stopped you know they 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 are not they're not at, at all anymore you know sort of in some sense useful uh, to the knowledge economy that we are going to create 50% of our women are anemic you know so this dualism has to end and what can we do to end this dualism and i think we should put this dualism very up front right middle and center of any agenda of any conversation that we talk about and we the elite and i'm counting all of us as ourselves 
must now no more become you know immune to this i remember the time and i must say and i i, I confess this uh, with uh, with some with, with some embarrassment at one point of time i start i had stopped going to mumbai because it was so much in the face you know when i would travel from the airport you know why some you know, some some and when the taxi will take me to the you know to the road which is which runs along the port line which will take me by a seon and so on and i said i couldn't take it anymore and i really admired my friends who lived there and then have the chores next door you know just suppose cheek to cheek and yet have nothing you know and 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 be so i mean but that's what the reality is in this country and i and i do happen to go out very often into the into you know about 200 kilo, 100 kilometers radius around delhi as a, as a point i do that and into the go 50 kilometers out of delhi this is a different world that we are living there you know, so how what can we so this 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 immunization so i hope covid has inoculated us enough uh, to show to tell us that we we will not let this happen to us ourselves because that actually is really in some sense un, undoing of our own humanity in the, and whatever profession we might be whatever we do i think that's the something that we just need to go uh, you know and and therefore and by the way here again i must i must refer to the fact that i was even even more shocked my wife runs a ngo for taking care of uh, leprosy affected people i don't know how many of you have been to one of those colonies right in the middle of every urban center etc and you know and and see how the how the people uh, live and what you know and, uh, and and amit referred to the to 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 people begging on the streets etc you know the knock on your window on your car should awake us all the time now here i must therefore say that there is there is a there is a huge role that is played what let me call us let me call them as shadow institutions in our society you know these are the charity organizations these are the you know these are the religious trusts these are the gurdwaras these are the you know the, the temples the masjids and so on you know which run a parallel organization parallel network actually all the time not just in covid but but you know regularly i mean as it were you know and 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 without them but and they don't get recognized they do not a part of our mainstream dialogue i think it's time to mainstream them you know and it's time to mainstream every uh, civil society organization i like to call them development partners rather than civil society organizations and 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 surely not ngos because why should we refer to them to, to anybody as a non government i mean you know i mean i just don't see the point of that you know so let's call them development partners for god's sake and you know and all of them should now become you know as, as a part of the mainstream because without them as amit has said we can't possibly do anything that we want to do now how do we do that is the question and the, and, and 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 what do we uh, and what do we uh, how do we go about it but before i come to that i think there is a third stakeholder in the in the room and i don't know whether and I'm, yeah, there you are amit is there and muthu is there and so on which is the corporate world you know which is the world which must be on board uh, with the government and the development partners the civil society without with without whose presence and without whose active participation i think we will not go anywhere at all and you know and i think this is it is important uh, because a uh, large number of us you know uh, do satis get satisfaction by doing something on the side and the csir csr is an activity which you, which we hand over uh, to some wives clubs or you know or some people you need know, to run for them i think this has to get integrated within our main business order and, I, and there is now a very good movement uh, called conscious capitalism when i was secretary general of fiki i wanted to bring that in but i'm afraid uh, i was thwarted uh, completely and totally in doing so our own raj sodia professor at i think bentley college and then one more person who written books on it the the short point being and we can go back in the question that the adam smithian capitalism of the 18th century is no more sufficient for our world at that time women were not in position top position at that time there was no question of you know labor rights marx wrote about it in very very amazing terms that if there were if workers were found in the cities you know loitering around for the third time they were actually you hot iron was used to mark them as b which is vagrants and then they were sent to workhouses to work for free in manchester and liverpool now that capitalism is 
gone, dead and gone. And we haven't yet in India, even not even tried to rediscover a new form of capitalism. Capitalism. The Japanese have done it. You know, the Koreans have done it. The Chinese have made a capitalism which has got seamless between public sector and private sector. You don't know where one ends and one begins. We haven't been able to do that. We still, despite what Yogi Deveshwar did in terms of when he was a CII president to talk consistently about you know, the triple bottom line, et cetera, I am not sure whether this has got integrated into our corporate behavior, into our corporate ethics, as it were. And CSR, CSR it's, it's a travesty to say that you have to mandate to N percent, two or whatever percent for that to go to the CSR. And I think the new mantra has to be that you can do well by while doing good. And I think that's where we must, all three of us, come on the same platform and have a conversation where we know that we have to do well for the country. Uh, you know, and whatever we do, uh, you know, we have to get our act together to act, to go beyond oneself. You know, this whole last 70 years or more, or maybe even earlier, I mean, because of our poverty and so on, you know, there is this uh, famous saying from, Mah from Ramayan, Koi nrip hoye hame ka haani, dasi chhod na bani ho rani. You know, so th there you go. If, if, that, if that mentality sticks to us, you know, all the mentality that keep away from the government because, you know, you come near the government, that means trouble. So, you know, the less government, the less you see of them, the better off you are. All of that has to change. And, the, you know, just like in the national movement when the corporate world was with the national movement leaders, and Gandhi didn't wink an eyelid to stay in the Birla house. Again, the time has come when we must change and not use the you know, titles of some business houses as in some sense slurs you know, in, our, in, our, in our conversations. All that has to change. And I think this time has come to create that platform where the three of us can come together. And there are two or three things that I want to say in this regard and then I'll, you know, I've taken enough time as it were. But just before that, we in, in, in Niti Aayog have a portal called Darpan, which today has 90,000 uh, development partners listed on them. By the way, I don't know if you know that there are 3.6 million CSOs in this country. I, I don't think, I, I think less than 30% of them get their accounts audited. That portal, you know, that portal can actually become the basis uh, for creating this platform with the help from all of those. Now, what are the two or three uh, minimal condition that I want to put forward here. One, as I said earlier, repeating myself, there will be no point coming to that portal or to that platform if you're going to constantly think about what is in it there for me. You've got to, you've got to stop that. I mean, I think we need to get through it. That's the first part of it. The second uh, is that we've got to stop, the, change the mindset that the government is the Maibab government, the Parvardigar government, the, you know, the, the colonial government, which is going to do everything for us. No, sorry. You know, the government uh, will, you know, it, it's not uh, the colonial government, the degrees of freedom that the Indian state enjoys, I think is far too much at all levels. So the second thing would be that we need to uh, get accountability into the system, at least on this platform, so that everybody who comes to that platform is, is open to being accountable, is open to being a question and, and, you know, and, 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 and work forward on that regard, whichever stakeholder you come from. Third, I think is complete transparency in whatever you're doing and transparency and full disclosure you know, that you're doing this for this reason and that's what you've got. Fourth, I think honest, candid feedback. I worked in both industry organizations and that was one thing that was completely missing from there. You know, and I, and I, you know, because that was just, they were, they were set up for giving a feedback. Uh, for the government. But that's exactly what uh, I think they have failed to do. They do, do it in private, perhaps. But I remember a conversation with a former finance minister who said, why are you telling me this? Your members come and tell me something completely the opposite, you know, so, and so on. So now this feedback is important because if you don't have, then the system is in the silicurbium. Now, if you have those four or five conditions, and I don't want to go on any longer, but then we can get a convergence. And we should, and finally, we can get a convergence only if we get a target for ourselves. 1990, India and China had the same per capita income of about 350 or 150 to our 350 odd dollars. Today, they are five times our size, five times per capita income size. 
can we agree to a target for ourselves he is coming this with us with us most of most of the audience would be in their prime by the time we celebrate the centenary of our republic uh, maybe i maybe i won't be there i suppose not but for you guys you have to decide for your own target for 2047 where would you want india to be and then create a movement then create a platform where all the three stakeholders can put together in a context where you are you going to remain a full democracy with equal rights and human human rights and so on where your carbon constraint would be biting so that you won't have the you know you don't have the liberty of retro retrofitting you will have to do whatever you can and third where the global economy and the global world is going to be so turbulent that we haven't seen it in the past few decades thanks for listening to me i can't listen thank you can can you hear me just now no, no, no. Yeah. yeah yeah thank you sorry uh you made made a number of fascinating points first of all i love the term of development partners i think we should be using a lot more of that um than simply ngos uh, you made a number of fascinating points rajiv and i wanted to start off by building um on on one uh, which has particularly come to uh, haunt uh the hot spots that uh have arisen in covid actually um uh, mumbai pune delhi uh you know uh, and many of the other cities uh, and we realize that the correlation of all these hot spots is essentially because of the prevalence of slums um and i think many people especially the uh, skeptics used to you know scoff at campaigns like swachh bharat etc and we now uh, realize the wisdom of some of them there were also a lot of uh skeptics who used to laugh at the role of many ngos um in wash campaigns um i think today we realize the wisdom of them i think uh i would love to start off by having a uh, a short conversation with you on what do you think the opportunity is in the years ahead for uh civil society and the government to work constructively uh collaboratively in redefining what happens to uh this really sticky problem that has existed for many many decades in many of our uh uh metropolitan cities i mean even in a you talked about uh the problem in mumbai i've actually you know even as we speak uh, my wife and i have been working in dharavi and mbord mbord is actually even worse than dharavi the life expectancy in mbord is 41 years uh, in a city where um you know life expectancy is in the 60s um and you know uh, the sanitation conditions are absolutely abysmal it's not surprising that uh, once the germ and uh, entered there uh, that we have the crisis that we have on its uh, on our hands so you know we've seen that uh, world war 2 actually was a crisis that precipitated that resulted in the rebuilding of many of today's most developed nations how do we really convert this crisis as you uh, talk, you know uh, rightly term, you know put, put forth as a as a platform into really an opportunity for different people to come together as partners and rebuild india slums yeah. um love to get your thoughts on that i yeah, mean i mean thanks thanks a ton and um, i hope i'll you see a piece of mine in either the hindu or business line just on this topic uh, maybe a day after or you know or, or to even tomorrow uh, because we, we, what i've argued there is that uh, you know 11 cities in india account for 66% of covid cases uh, that's 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 the toll and, uh, and 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 i think it's shown up very clearly that it is this acute congestion and the lack of civil civic uh, uh, amenity that is you know that's that become a real uh, cause for all of this and you know the dharavi density is 3.75 lakh per square kilometer i mean is unimaginable what's led me what's led me to from there a uh, little differently from what you're saying is that we need to rethink our urban development model completely have an issue we have to go back to the drawing board 
Uh, and you know, and there, uh, I mean, I used to poo poo it for you know when I was earlier, when I was a, when I was a nice uh, red-blooded uh, communist. But Gandhi said a lot of good things there. You know, you know, I'm not talking about self-sufficient uh, villages, but I'm talking about you know Rarbun. I'm talking about Abdul Kalam Azad's work, development, and, and Professor Indresen's work on Pura, you know, which is the uh, <clears throat> you know urban amenities in rural areas. And there's a talk, and, 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 I, and I've got a presentation, some architects in Bhopal have got together as to how you can create you know, satellite cities which will decongest our metros. See, I think that's what we need to do today. What we need to do, and I think the, the important thing, uh, you know, so let, let me first emphasize that one, we have had a, uh, we, we've had only a, um, a, a parody of urban planning. I mean, we need to get that organized. You know, first, but when you do that, you need to rethink completely how India's urban spaces will develop. And I think Kerala is a very good model. You don't know where you know in Kerala where rural begins and urban ends. And therefore, by the way, uh, Abraham Rubin from IDFC pointed out to me when we were in Kerala together that in the official records, 66% of Kerala is, is rural, while actually the, the opposite is true. But but that's the official record of it. But nonetheless, you know. So if you, and, and the one thing about the city that we had heard from urban planners of Harvard and so on, is that they are the centers of innovation because they allow, you know, me crossing the line, dots, you know, and they allow multiple, you know, sort of, you know, uh, interaction of multiple disciplines. Technology has changed that. Today, you can all interact on the cloud, you know, with all your ideas. So you don't need physical proximity as you did when Manhattan came up. And, and, and that explained, man, you can change that. So today, if you get your, you know, fiber everywhere in the bandwidth that you want, you can get, you can get talents, you know, dispersed all over the country and who could be interacting. I'm just saying that simply to say that's feasible today. It's feasible today and not just feasible, but for everything that we need, whether it's the carbon footprint, the green, the equity, this, et cetera, and, and the elimination of dualism, you need to rethink urban you know, uh, uh, ab initio. And this is where the three development partners must collaborate, you know, must collaborate. We must encourage younger architects to come up, you know, uh, you know and, and create our, you know, carbon positive spaces and et cetera. So we can go into the details, but this could be a platform. This could be a niche area where all the three of us could come together and say, this is what we want in India in 2047 to look like, you know, and therefore we need to reverse all of this and we need to build further. And I think that would be a great goal uh, to achieve. Amit, you are on mute. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, other issue, Rajiv, that you touched upon in your uh, opening remarks, and again, I wanted to just uh, use the opportunity to build upon it and get your thoughts on how you think um, civil society can act as a partner for the government uh, in, in helping address is this whole issue of reimagining livelihoods. Um, you know, on one hand, you know, we have, we any case had a, a problem which technology was precipitating of, uh, you know, greater amount of um, unemployment. And it was, uh, it was very gradual, um, you know, not many jobs were getting created. And then suddenly we've had a situation where many people have got thrown off the payrolls. Uh, it seems that we'll have to reimagine livelihoods uh, from scratch uh, in order to ensure, as uh, Mr. Muthuraman put it, um, hundreds of people aren't pushed back into poverty. Otherwise, we'll really have to create a massive welfare state. Uh, what role do you think uh, NGO civil society uh, can play in ensuring that, um, you know, we really reimagine livelihoods and uh, and, and we don't have a real crisis on our hands in that, in that area. Very honestly, I haven't um, uh, thought through this, I mean, uh, just in the sense that I thought through the urban situation, but not, not, not this one. 
it's a very complex, very real, you know, very, very important issue that you raised here. And the other day I was uh, in, a, in a meeting with a group of people and I, uh, I heard the very true remark uh, that uh, given the crisis now, uh, pe people, human employees will be even at a further discount because people know that they can disrupt their business. So I would rather have, you know, a, a non-human <laughs> doing my job because they don't, they don't walk away. You know, they don't require, so I mean, that's, you know, that's the sort of, but, but here, I, and I'm thinking aloud at the moment, but I must, let's, let me start off by where I mentioned earlier. Uh, Kai Fook Lee, who is a, you know, the CEO of Amazon and I think Microsoft and now going back, he went through a cancer and so on. He talks about the fact that even a universal basic income scheme will not suffice in the new world. Because you will not have, you cannot expect a society where you just kind of give away a door to a section of the people and say that, look, you exist. However high, however high that door might be, people would have to, a part of our identity is that we think that we are contributing uh, to the society in some ways or the other. You know, and, and if you're just on a, on, on a UBI, you don't do that. So he comes up, and I think this is where, uh, you know, we together, development partners, all of us can work together, is to try and create an empathetic society first and foremost. You know, society which empathizes with, uh, you know, the other. You know, because without that, you won't get anywhere. You know, without, and this is, by the way, this goes beyond charity. You know, I mean, you know, you can't just go give food and clothes and come back and then uh, I got done well and all the guilt is gone. No, empathy is, to, is, is something different. In, empathy is an ongoing emotion. Empathy is something which drives your behavior. So I think uh, it, it, it sounds trite and it sounds probably, you know, but, but I mean, I think that's the necessary condition. Uh, beyond that, what you will need to do is then accept the situation that only a part of us will be engaged in so-called productive labor, you know, which produces goods and services which other people consume. And so what we need to do, therefore, is to think consciously about how we bring in the other aspects like culture, entertainment, art, craft, as a part of our consumption basket. You know, nature, you know, uh, nature and, you know, society and all of that. And because there can be a large number of us who can be delivering that. And that's one area where we can absorb many, many more. If, for example, wildlife could be a part of our consumption basket, we can have thousands of volunteers trying to save, you know, the bird species which we are losing by the day. You know, so do you see what I'm saying? And, and again, uh, you know, there is this division so far, which is that if you're not productively employed, then you are, you know, you are dispensable. How to change that? How do we change that? And so far, uh, that, that's one part of it. And that the other part, you know, and therefore from the very childhood, if I a classroom, we can, you know, we can introduce that. Again, going back to Gandhi, he brought this idea of Nai Talim, which said that every child from the age of six, seven onward, should get to know everything about the flora, fauna around their own, you know, habitation, about the village and the city that you're living in. We start our education by learning first about the Andes and then about the Arabalis, you know, but that, that can be reversed because then we'll get sensitive to where we are. That's the first part. The second part is this requires a very big change in our education system, uh, which is that the education should be such that gives us the agility the mental capability and the mental agility to adapt to changing conditions. Because livelihood will change. You know, on an average uh, in, the, in the US, people change, I think, 3.7 careers in their lifetime. In our case, we get in at one at 21, and we don't leave this till, you know, till 61. You know, I mean, so that has to change, that will change, unfortunately. And I, hopefully that change will come also within the sector that I am currently in, you know, which is the government. Now, I think those are a couple of things that we need to think about. And, and you know, and I think it's, it's, it's important, by the way, uh, you know, that we introduce, uh, you know, the, the non-material aspects in the consumption basket that we have. But we are actually at a stage much earlier than that, uh, which is that our own uh, delivery of public services, you know, health and education and environment and swachata, and we need to then uh, create livelihoods around them rather than only think about all the time being obsessed with manufacturing, as we very often tend to do, uh, and, and, and we'll create a and, and we'll create a society which can be much better than what we have today.
Yeah, sorry, I needed to be unmuted. Yeah, I know. In fact, uh, I wanted to just build on that. I I do think that uh, there may be a opportunity, Rajiv, as you rightly put it, for us to potentially look at uh, reimagining livelihoods by defining what are some of the most important problems facing mankind, humankind rather, and figuring out if uh, workforce can actually be redeployed to solving them. I mean, for example, climate change. How many people are actually focused on solving climate change? Um, can hundreds of thousands of people be uh, deployed in that area working for, with development partners? Um, you know, how many people are currently working on uh, afforestation, for example, uh, you know, as an initiative? And I think we need to first just redefine that. How many people are working, for example, on health initiatives in, um, you know, India's, uh, uh, you know, uh, aspiration districts? Um, and there could be great opportunities in just uh, addressing some of the problems that you talked about, malnutrition, for example. And I think people have historically, these are areas which have been significantly understaffed. And we could uh, use this as an opportunity to go after some of those more sticky problems. Uh, so I agree with you. I think you've probably uh, seeded some of the kernels for uh, re-looking at uh, livelihoods. Um, and there could be problems which have been understaffed in the past that we could go after. Uh, and, and, and maybe that's worth thinking about uh, in greater degree of uh, detail. Uh, Rajiv, I want to shift gears a little bit. Can I just add one thing yes, here? Yes, please. Uh, because uh, we, 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 both of us have been guilty of not bringing in at all uh, the concerns of the women uh, you know, yes. into our conversation. And I think we should do that. I, I say this simply because you need a large number of people to work to first find out why India has such a low female labor participation rate. And then to work on that, to improve that, you know, in the sense that what are these, what are the conditions that we need? And creches are not the only answer, by the way. And there's, there's a lot more that's going on there. And how do we bring them in? And given the technology, we can use that. Now that again can be a source of a livelihood for a very large number of people. You know, how to you know, care, you know, how to protect, how to safeguard, how to you know, go for, you know, look after the interests of women so that they can contribute more to the society you know, as we go forward. I think that's, that's one area that we can, and just one other sentence, uh, I mean, you know, redefining the share of public goods in our consumption basket. All that you referred to were public goods, you know, which is, you know, the environment and the climate, et cetera. And, you know, you can need, you know, clean water and rivers, you know, and lakes and all of that. How many people get employed or deployed there? Zilch, you know, why not? Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Uh, you know, in fact, I've come across a few organizations which are uh, done some good work uh, in that area and started seeding it. Uh, uh, but I think a lot more needs to happen um, uh, in that area. Rajiv, I, I want to move to questions which are coming through in the, they actually well over a uh, hundred questions already. I think the, <laughs> uh, that's probably because the meter stops after 99 <laughs> but, uh, and I'm having trouble tracking all of them. Uh, so I'm going to, my apologies uh, uh, to the audience. I'm going to, go with what's bubbling up on uh, my chat line. Um, there's a question from uh, Radha Madhav Mela. Um, while corporates uh, did activity-based CSR during the COVID crisis, do um, you think that they can make these more long-term goals with proper uh, uh, assessment criteria? Should they be aligning their, uh, uh, you know, these with... Uh, SDGs as a longer term strategy. Now, uh, what's your view on that, Rajiv? I mean, over to you, I suppose. <laughs> um, you know, I, I do think as Rajiv, as actually you pointed out in your comments that uh, many of the areas that, uh, all that COVID has done is actually it's taken uh, areas that have been neglected in for decades and highlighted them. Um, you know, it's probably just uh, highlighted them suddenly um, and these are areas, uh, for example, sanitation, urban development, um, which should have been, you know, the area of focus for us for many, many years. And so I think, uh, yes, uh, so, some of these are things that we should be focusing on. Uh, they should be aligned with SDGs and they should be a part of, uh, uh, you know, the CSR objectives for organization. And by the way, I do think many uh, co corporates, unfortunately, keep changing their CSR objectives. Um, you know, on a 
sometimes uh, annual uh, annual basis they should actually have long term csr uh, objectives yeah just to uh, add to what you said uh, i mean this is that uh, sdgs offer a wonderful framework for us to direct and focus our attention and our efforts as it were and i think in, in niti ayog we have created a little sort of a, you know ball a little circle with all the sdgs and kept right in the lobby so that everybody can notice them every morning uh, you know uh, corporates could start off by creating an awareness about sdgs you know in their in their own uh, sphere that's the first important thing i think that's the one thing that they can do and the second thing is that you know that uh, they can adopt one or two sdgs as their principal concerns whichever they choose you know, and then continue to work on them as it were uh, and but the third as i said earlier in my talk which is that i think it's important now to integrate some of that into your daily routine you know in some way you know because if and if, if for example you you adopt let's say just a you know mundane thing maybe like you know uh, like uh, you know a you know child nourishment can corporates make sure that every child of every worker in their establishment is not undernourished you know have they can they take that guarantee not as a part of doing charity but just you know as a, as, as something that is you know that that's done or you know and and lastly i think uh, the prime minister has said is very often we need to convert our development into a jan andolan you see development is not being done by them and we are not the recipients of development you know and we are not you know just, development is us all and i think the corporate with their vast resources in terms of networking and in terms of being able to you know change public opinion if they can just do that for a while just like the national movement time that happened that the corporate at that time converted national movement into a jan andolan led by gandhi can we try and do that you know the development is about all of us and the corporates uh, would take the lead in uh, in spreading this awareness because that is the only way that you will improve accountability in our system uh rajiv uh, there are lots of lots of questions but since you invoked gandhi ji i'm going to um just <laughs> and we have 2 minutes left i'm going to try to uh, get your thoughts on one issue um uh, in the wrap up uh, wrap up question which is you know uh, many of us in the corporate world have a tendency to um try to do something send out a press release make sure that uh, people know we have done something and you use the words jan andolan how do we make sure that everyone out there moves to a spirit of not uh just doing something but knowing that we have done wh whatever best we could how do we make this truly a jan andolan how do we invoke this spirit it exists in much of the not for profit sector they could have they could have sat down and you know been bystanders but people have really rolled up their sleeves and you can see how people have i think i mean maybe give you a very sort of maybe not a useful but a very practical example which is that if uh, all the ceos of our companies in the formal sector forget the informal sector for a while but, but if all the ceos uh, took a weekly or a monthly town hall and asked their employees their workers is what have they done to the society you know in that week or in that month you know other than what they have done you know and not not charity but actually where have they gone and involved themselves have they cleaned up the beaches or have they looked after the park or did they go and look after the servants quarters etc all of that is development by the way right yes and 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 you could think about you know several other things if you just did a town hall i think the movement will catch on and you can then involve your development partners into doing that you know so that they can all come in together and you will see you know lo and behold i won't i won't even give it 5 years before development is a jan andolan thank you so much rajiv always wonderful talking to you i remember the last time you and i did a fireside chat again without any fire at the cii healthcare summit yeah. uh, thank you so much for launching the plenary and over to you lakshmi <laughs>